Well, if you feel that, that your life is insignificant, I've got good news for you this morning, that your life can actually be significant, not insignificant. All of us want to have something from God that makes an impact, right? And we're going to be talking about our dear friend, the writer of the first gospel that we um, have in the Bible in the New Testament, and his name is Matthew. Okay, wonderful. Okay, open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We're going to read verses 27 through 29. It's up on your screen. Um, I like to read it here just from God's Word. I mean, I have it in front of me, but as you got it. Lady Levi, uh, pardon me, <coughs> um, 27. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple. Jesus said to him, so Levi, uh, so Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home and Jesus, uh, with Jesus as a guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of the law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Sure. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, in our text, As Jesus went from there, he saw a man. I love that. Jesus saw a man. When Jesus looks at you, he sees you. It's not like he just passes by, but he sees you, Mike. He sees you, Sharon. He sees you, Lucy. It's not like he's not conscious of who we are, but he sees us. And so he saw a man there named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And I love this. Matthew got up and followed him. When Jesus sees you, when, when he gazes into our lives, and we're going to look at that this morning, what do we do? Most people and a lot of people today have a feeling of insignificance, and it's prevalent everywhere. People just have this doubt, this feeling that my life really doesn't mean anything. It's, it's not impactful. It doesn't change anything. And maybe you sitting here this morning, you might be feeling just a little like that. People are overwhelmed by scientific technological discoveries. This morning, I wanted to download my sermon onto the tablet that we use in the back there. It says it's out of room. I'm like, what? It was fine yesterday, but not today. And I tried this morning to reboot. Lucky Sharon had another tablet, and we put it on there, and so we got away with it. But just the frustration, we oftentimes become so dependent upon technology. Um, at our men's retreat, I wasn't dependent on that. I printed everything up. So just in case something like this morning would happen, it didn't happen because we had a hard copy of it. In the age of depersonalization, people are so digitized into video or snapshots or Snapchat, or whatever, that's an old app, I guess, um, on a phone or a screen and our text time, and we just look at people. Sometimes we don't even look at the people because you're not using the screen time. Or if you're on WhatsApp, you just text or you leave a message, whatever. But it's become so impersonal. And that's why, Bob, thank you for sharing that this morning. This is so important that we have this one-on-one, -on -one, face to face interaction with one another, a hug or a pat on the back. It's so, so vitally important, the fellowship. And Hebrews tells us that as well. But Christ comes to say that your life can be significant. Your life, your personal life can be significant. Think of the possibilities of life in Christ or the life that God has for you, that Christ has for you. Imagine the greatest success that could come to you today. Maybe you've been trying something. Maybe you've been thinking about something. If God could just, what, what, what is that greatest success that maybe you can come, that, that, that can happen in your life? Levi, Matthew, is an example of one of those who went from feeling insignificant to feeling valued and dignified. Someone's alarm just went off in the parking lot. I don't know if you recognize the cars. They all sound the same, don't they? <coughs> His old name was Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Matthew literally means a gift of God. Apparently, the name was given to commemorate his conversion and the call of being a disciple. I want to explain to you what these four Gospels mean. The Gospel of Matthew is sometimes referred to as the Gospel of the King. It bridges be it's a bridge between the Old and the New Testament. In fact, Matthew is specifically geared toward Jewish readers. 
The Gospel of Mark is referred to as the Gospel of the Servant and was primarily written to Roman readers. Luke, on, on the other hand, wrote to the Greeks and, pre and presented Jesus as the perfect Son of Man. The Gospel of John is more universal and his message was, this is the Son of God, or oftentimes it's referred to as the Gospel of God's love or the Gospel of love because he so emphasizes God's love toward us. Matthew was accustomed to keeping a very systematic bookkeeping. Remember, he was very meticulous. Um, after all, he was a tax collector, so his records had to be very meticulous. And so when you read his gospel, you'll find it's very meticulously recorded and written down. It is the account of our Lord's life and his ministry. Matthew wrote to show how Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and the promises concerning the coming of Messiah. And again, the emphasis was, again, to his Jewish readers. He used at least 129 quotations or allusions to the Old Testament in his gospel. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Referring to the Old Testament, that's why it's so important that you read the Old Testament, because when you read these in the New Testament, Matthew's gospel, and he'll quote the Old Testament, you have no idea what he's talking about unless we know what is written there. And if you're using the cross-references, go back and see what Matthew was quoting. He's a model to us of the difference that Christ can make in a person who hears and responds to the invitation of discipleship. You and I are called to be disciples of Christ. Matthew was a tech tax collector. In today's terms, he would be an IRS agent. One of those people we just absolutely love and love to send our money to, right? Well... The feeling was mutual back then, too. Now, tax collectors aren't very popular, even as they were at that time. But in Palestine, it was especially true. People hated tax collectors. The Romans placed a tax on all property, real and personal. Collection of taxes was farmed out by the Roman government, and a man would pay the government a fixed sum for the right to collect taxes in any given district, and then would take all he could get. It was usually a high Roman official that was given the responsibility of collecting this burdensome tax from the suppressed people. And in most cases, they would in turn hire others to do it for them. They would farm it out. They would hire people to do that. His profit would be the amount that he was able to collect in excess that he was paid. So they raised the taxes to feather their own pockets. Sounds familiar. <clears throat> the patriotic, loyal Jew would never, would absolutely never even consider being a tax collector. It was an office that was despised. But now and then, however, one, would move, one who was moved by greed would take the office of being a tax collector to enrich himself. Such was Matthew. He went in it for the dineros, for the dollars, for the shekels, for the rands, whatever. He was in it for himself. How could he enrich himself? He had what was considered a disreputable business of the time. He wasn't accepted. He was thrown out. He, he was clearly shunned. Clearly, he didn't care too much about his reputation. And remember that being a tax man was the object of criticism in the community. He was evidently afflicted with an insatiable desire for money. He loved money. Hmm. I wonder if that's the case maybe in some of our lives and maybe even in our own particular circles. It was logic logical for him to take more money as a tax collector than he could in any other profession. It was a profession, he said, this is lucrative, I could do this. And especially knowing bookkeeping, he was good at it. And if this were the case, we see that there's some striking resemblances maybe perhaps between him and us today. Are we chasing money? Are we chasing? Are we doing things correctly? He certainly wasn't considered a patriot at all. In fact, he was shunned by people. Being a tax collector, Matthew identified himself with the Roman enemy, the Roman army occupation of the time. He was seen as one of them. By the very nature of the case, it would have been necessary for him to have sought and maintained the favor of his superiors, rather than looking out for the best interests of his fellow citizens. 
He was working for Rome, in other words. Every accepted standard, by every accepted standard, he was considered an irreligious man. And yet he grew up in Judaism. He knew the Old Testament. He knew it well. We know that because we see his gospel as he refers to so many prophecies. Tax collectors were classified with sinners, were classified with prostitutes in the minds of people. They were considered thieves as well as traitors, and their constant contact with the Gentiles made them religiously unclean. So Matthew couldn't even go to the temple to go worship. He was unclean. He couldn't go and worship. The scribes and the Pharisees would pass by the tax collectors and wouldn't even look in their direction. Boys whose actions frequently expressed their thinking threw stones at them, spat at them, spat on their garments. And so imagine Matthew being so despised. I wonder how he felt. I mean, he had probably a very small circle of Jewish friends, but there were other tax collectors that he probably hung out with and other sinners regarded in the scriptures the more brazen then spat and they would then run away and hide in the alley alleys not to be caught no wonder Matthew felt insignificant he didn't have too much of a self esteem he probably had a sense of guilt about his work he was ostracized from his people and he was so despised and hated by others that he began maybe even to despise and help and, and, and hate himself it explains in part the dismay and the, and, and the surprise of the Pharisees when they saw Jesus then attending a banquet in Matthew's house following his conversion. Look at that. This Jesus, who you say is the Messiah, sitting with tax collectors. How dare he? How disgusting. Look at that. He's hanging out with sinners. We see them looking down. And then one day, as Matthew was sitting at the gate, scanning the ledgers, there was a shadow that came across his book. I'm just exaggerating a little. He lifted his head to see Jesus looking kindly down at him. There must have been something in that look. The eyes looked through and through. And in that gaze, Matthew saw his destiny. You see, when Jesus sees you, he doesn't just see you for who you are. He sees you for what you can be. Matthew had surely heard about Jesus before they had met that day in a place where he was collecting his taxes. It is quite possible that Matthew heard both his preaching and maybe even his teaching, and that he'd seen the results of Jesus' miraculous power. But Jesus saw something worthy in Matthew. Jesus sees something worthy in you and I. In each one of you, Jesus sees that. He saw a man with hidden hungers and divine desires. See, God has placed that vacuum in each of our lives that only He can fill. And so there's that natural desire for God. The people saw Levi as a sinner, but Jesus saw him as a saint. Perspective. The people saw Levi, the greedy publican. Christ saw Matthew as the author and useful disciple. He knew that Matthew would be the author of the gospel. Jesus always sees the best in people and was always bringing it about. I love that about the Lord. He always brings about the best in us. Jesus today sees something in you. Your life can be significant in His kingdom. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you can be significant. The gospel of Jesus offers hope to all people. You and I this morning, our people are so, we are so privileged because of the hope that we have. There's a chance that every person even the most unlikely, unlovely, and sinful to be the person that Jesus sees that they can be. And all the, all the, all the apostles, they, they, each one got changed dramatically. We've seen people who, who, who were murderers come to find Jesus. We've seen the, what Christ can do in a person's life. A life may be covered with the dust and debris of sin, but underneath is a soul whom Jesus cares for and loves. We must remember that even as we see people. Jesus didn't only come to save the innocent and the pure and the refined. He came to save everyone. There's not a person that Jesus doesn't want to save. People probably thought Christ's choice of Matthew as a disciple was probably unwise. 
Lord, why would you choose this guy over here? I mean, what, what, what use could he be? And in chapter 9, verses 12 through to 13, we read, And he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus saw Matthew as a sinner. When Jesus saved you, where were you? Were you living a righteous and perfect and holy life? No, I could say definitely not. But when Jesus came, he changed. My life changed. Matthew needed Jesus. You say, well, does God need people? Of course he does. God loves humanity so much. If he didn't, then why would Jesus have even come? Jesus came for you and you and for all of us because God loves us and had a plan for us. Matthew recognized his need. Matthew's wealth hadn't satisfied the hunger of his soul. You see, money can never fill the vacuum that's there. No amount of wealth can satisfy the deepest hunger of the human heart. He was sick and tired of his lifestyle and wanted a change. The one who was, is great enough to make life is also the one who could remake it. The one who created Matthew can change him and make him brand new. The old has passed away and all things become new, Paul said. Christ's power transforms and elevates us to a higher possibilities of life. In each of our lives, it is possible. Christ can do for you that no one else can do for you. He can cure the love of gambling in your life. Maybe you're addicted to that. He can put out the fires of lust in your heart. He can take away the love of alcohol. He can take away lying, cheating, and cursing. He can remove pride and prejudice and jealousy. Many of us have said, I would give anything to change. I've tried it, but I can't. In your own strength, you can't. But with God, all things are possible. There is hope. Jesus Christ can transform your life. Matthew tells the story of his own conversion in Matthew 9. Matthew tells how Jesus healed a man who was paralyzed, the woman who had been ill for 12 years, and two blind men. But right in the midst of these great miracles, Matthew tells how he came to become a follower of Christ. In Matthew 9, verse 9, And Jesus was walking along, and he saw a man named Matthew. This is Matthew writing in, in the third person about himself. Sitting at the tax collector's booth, follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. And so Matthew got up. So he, just in a very brief account, he tells us how he got saved. Jesus saw me. Jesus said to me, follow me. And I did. When Jesus sees you, what do we do? Do we get up and we say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Do you know yourself? Matthew opened his heart and he became a new person. But do you know yourself? Do you know where you're at? Do you have any idea of the power, the glory, and the greatness that is latent within you that God can change your life? Christ knows what you can be. The marvelous thing about Jesus Christ is that he did great things with the most unlikely people. God can do amazing things in our lives. Even though you may feel insignificant this morning, God can do amazing things in your life. The marvelous thing about Christ is that he did great things in these individuals. He saw the possibilities of the prodigal, a woman taken in adultery, the thief that was dying on the cross next to him. Jesus saw into their lives. Jesus sees into your life this morning. He sees into my life. Each one of us have this openness that Christ gazes into our lives. Jesus saw Matthew. Jesus sees you. You're not insignificant. He was continually giving people the power to become new creatures. When Jesus touches a life, the instruments of evil become instruments of good. When your life changes, you are radically transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. The voice of blasphemy becomes a voice of love. The hand of hate becomes a hand of mercy. That's what Christ does in our lives. Every talent, if properly dedicated, can be an instrument for God to use. God's gifted you with all these wonderful talents. Say to him, Lord, I give them to you. And you can have my heart, Lord. You can have my heart. We sang that this morning. Do with it whatever you choose. A sense of significance comes in doing whatever we can for the Master. Christ wanted Matthew. 
he most certainly lost a lot income of his income when he became a follower of Jesus. Luke's gospel records that Matthew left everything. So Levi got up and he left everything and followed him. He forsook his business. He forsook his hopes of wealth. He forsook his companions such as they were. He forsook his luxury. He forsook a life of disloyalty to his country, turning away from the temptations of dishonesty and bad company. The first thing that Matthew did, and we read it this morning, he became, when he became a follower of Jesus, was to make a lavish feast and invite all his friends and the other tax collectors, who also, incidentally, Gentiles, to meet with Jesus, the Savior, who could do for them as he had done for Matthew in restoring his own soul. Jesus wanted to introduce this man, Jesus, who transformed his life. And he wanted to tell other people, come and meet Jesus. He wanted to introduce them. So he invited them to come to his house, right there at his table, and recline with them. It showed us that Matthew certainly wasn't a pauper, but to put on a lavish feast like that cost him a pretty shekel. Before long, however, he knew what it was meant to share in the poverty that the master lived. Some, from being on this high hog as a tax collector, yes, being shunned, to living a life of poverty with Jesus. Not that Jesus never had anything to eat because there were people that came and supplied the disciples, of course. He knew that for the most part, his old friends would desert him. They would drop him like a hot potato as he became a dedicated follower of Jesus. The other tax collectors wouldn't give up their lucrative business. Jesus needed a man like Matthew who could use the method of doing Christian work. Matthew had left everything to follow Christ, his business, his money, his way of life. And none of, the, of, of any of the other apostles had given up as much as what Matthew had. Yeah, they gave up their business and stuff, but Matthew gave it all. His, his, everything, he gave it up for the kingdom. In the book of Acts, we find Matthew's name in the list of the 12 apostles. And through this, we see that Matthew remained loyal to Jesus during his entire life, even as we see him at the crucifixion. When he left the tax office, he brought with him that little instrument, his pen. Remember, he was meticulous. And some 20 to 30 years later, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, and instead of using his pen to write the names and the figures in a tax book, he, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and his guidance, wrote the first of the four Gospels in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. He no doubt was surprised to discover that he was actually the first author of the Gospels, the first book. Matthew wrote his Gospel expressly, again, delivering the message to his fellow countrymen that they too could find Jesus as Lord and Savior. Matthew, who was once despised by everyone, became the first man to represent the world in a written account of Jesus' life and teaching. It's from being a tax collector to being the author of the gospel that we still read 2,000 years later. An impact? Wow. You becoming significant from insignificance? Absolutely. Matthew, more than the rest, kept his personal thoughts in the background, telling us nothing directly or indirectly about himself. He was in the background, like many of the disciples were. They took the back seat because Jesus needed to be in the front seat. He wanted the one who had done so much for him to be the one who was to be exalted. Isn't that the purpose of all believers, is that Jesus be seen in us? That he is the one to receive all the honor and all the glory in our lives. Tradition has it that he preached the gospel for about 15 years in Judea to his fellow countrymen. His work is associated with Persia, modern-day Iran, Ethiopia, North Africa, Syria, and some traditions even associate him as preaching the gospel in Greece as well. He was later condemned to die for preaching the gospel. The wonderful thing is that he remained faithful to the end. Didn't Jesus say something like that? He who endures to the end, it's him that's going to be saved. The New Testament is actually silent about his life. But this we know about him, that wherever the scriptures travel in the world, Matthew's gospel still touches lives today. 
His writings still impact lives and reveal who Jesus is. Christ needed a man like Matthew who would work to save the sinful, the needy, and the neglected, to give them hope that if the Jesus could save me, the worst of sinners, there's hope for every single human being. And in comparison, does Jesus Christ confront you? And how does he do that today? He challenges you and I to forsake the lower, to choose the higher way of life. Leave that stuff and live for me. That's what Christ calls us to. And we can do that in whatever profession Christ calls us to, is to always live for Jesus. Jesus wants to utilize your talents for a nobler service that you may have not even thought of or that you may have planned. Let God use you. Let him shape you. Let him mold you. Transform you into the man and the woman and young person that God wants you to be. Jesus said in Matthew 9, verse 13, For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. When we recognize that we mess up and that we've royally messed up, but we know that because of God's grace and his love for us, Jesus can come into our lives, transform our lives, and make us into something wonderful, something amazing. And just like he transformed Matthew's life, he can transform your life. He can transform our community. His life was transformed from being insignificant to being significant in Christ's service. Your life can be transformed if you're feeling insignificant right now, or you feel downtrodden, or no one really cares, or no one really knows about you. There is someone. Maybe it's not a person, but let me tell you, Jesus cares about you. He sees you just as he saw Matthew. With your life surrendered to him, Jesus can write his message of love, his message of mercy, of helpfulness on the lives of others that you rub shoulders with. Such a work makes a significant and meaningful life. You and I, I pray that we have eyes that we would recognize Jesus' gaze on our life and say to him, Lord, I will follow you. May you and I have ears to hear and obey him when he himself invites us to follow him. As he invited Matthew, he invites you today. Come follow me. Doesn't force you. He simply says, come follow me. What are you going to do with that invitation? What will you do with such love just like Matthew experienced a life change from being insignificant, from being nothing, to a person who became significant. When you read the lives of many evangelists, you know, think of you know, Billy Graham who grew up on a farm and how he became so impactful. Who knows? Some of you might be a Billy Graham and Anne Graham. To what God can do in your life if you just say yes to him. Amen.